Hi, I'm Jenny Su, and I am presenting Kapalapala, The Path to Hawaiian Literacy. So traditionally, Hawaiians were um, socially organized by hierarchy. It was a system of hereditary, hereditary chiefs called ali'i um, who administered land rights. Land in Hawaii wasn't privately owned, it was all communal. So the chiefs divided the land by the island first, then by districts, then into smaller lots on the basis of topography. If you look at the figure, um, you'll see the map of Oahu and those lines drawn are the borders of these um, lots given to different families. Um, you'll see that every lot has access to the sea as well as to the mountains. And this is on purpose because then everyone has access to all the resources that they need for like crafting, for cultivating crops like taro and sweet potato, raising animals and raising and catching fish and even uh, making salt. Um, so it was very deliberate to make it, to make the lots uh, so elongated and reaching from the sea to the mountains. So Hawaiians also had an oral tradition. It's a formal system which was used to preserve and pass down knowledge. It's called mo'olelo. It roughly translates to history, genealogy, literature, or traditions. Um, and it's basically a continuous or connected narrative um, of a history or tradition. Uh, to do this, people memorized things, they um, recited things, and they listened. Uh, the preservation of knowledge would have been a necessary component to their continued survival as a people on an island with limited natural resources. So um, what we learned in the previous slide about the land being divided and um, how people tended to the land, those ideas um, could only be passed down generation to generation through oral traditions. Um, they didn't have any kind of writing system back then. Um, and so histories and knowledge could only be passed down orally. But eventually, um, literacy was introduced to Hawaiians. And um, like I said, pre-European contact, it was all oral based. Afterwards, um, in the beginning, a few Hawaiians, mostly the chiefs, learned to read and write. Um, but in 1820, Liho Liho, who was King Kamehameha II, in the picture, he allowed missionaries to enter Hawaii on the condition that they teach the ali'i to read first. In 1822, missionaries started the first Western schools for education using um, the first Hawaiian language book, which they produced. Um, and this really started a massive movement toward Hawaiian language literacy. The king, the chiefs, they're all um, really supportive of having all Hawaiians learn to read and write. Um, and you can compare by the numbers. In 1820, um, there was about a 0% literacy rate. By 1834, there was a 91% literacy rate. And this is of Hawaiian language, um, not English. Um, and you can compare this to the U.S. literacy rate of 98% in 1832 or 50% in Europe in 1850. Um, so within uh, just a little over 10 years, almost all of the Hawaiian population uh, was able to read and write. And they were really some of the most literate, literate people on the planet at that time. So in order to be able to, you know, have everyone be able to read and write, first you really need a spelling system um, and a way to learn. Um, since there was no writing, they adopted the word palapala um, to mean writing. And originally this word referred to the printing of tapa designs, which is the, the picture um, here. Type of designs, they were, um, it was like pounded bark wood and they would print uh, different designs on it using like rubber or wood block. Um, they painted things and used different dyes. Um, so that, that process uh, became, was called palapala and they used that for, uh, to, to say writing. Um, missionaries, they started with an imperfect imperf orthography or writing system uh, because creating an orthography can take 
long, long time. They didn't, they don't have the technology we have now to like um, analyze sounds, right? So back in the day, it really took a long time to develop something that was, um, that was correct. Um, so they started though with something that they knew was imperfect. Um, when they started teaching, how they would teach students was that students would um, spell words out loud in syllables and pronounce them. So it's very similar to, I would think, how, how a lot of uh, people end up learning in the beginning, especially if there's an alphabet. Um, for instance, in English, like the word dog, right? First you learn the alphabet and then you um, learn how those sounds match the, the, the words in a, in a word. So we have dog and you, you go da, a, uh, g. So, and you put it all together, you have dog, right? Um, and this is how they did it, right? They created a, a Hawaiian alphabet and then they just broke it down like that and people learned how to spell this way. Um, on like the first page of this pamphlet, um, they started with the first um, consonant in the, in the Hawaiian alphabet, which was a B. Um, and then the students would make the sound B. And then the first uh, vowel was an A, so they'd go ah. And then they'd say, put it together, and that would be ba. So it was um, uh, B, a, uh, ba. And that turned into the word for alphabet because they obviously didn't have the, that word in the beginning, right? Um, and just because this was the first thing almost every student learned um, how to read, that, that those sounds together became the word for alphabet, bi a ba. Um, that only lasted four years though, and I'll get into uh, why uh, later, but it, it changed, like the spelling for the word alphabet changed. Um, this figure is a picture from um, one of the first uh, printed editions, I believe, um, of the, um, the, the alphabet pamphlet of, and this is what people learn to read from. Um, so the first book was printed on January 7th, 1822. It was super popular. It only had eight pages and 500 copies were made in that first run. Uh, they printed an additional 2000 later on in the year. It had seven sections about learning how to read Hawaiian um, plus five short Bible passages. An example is seen on the right side of this figure. Um, later on, like a few years later, they ended up selling 20,000 copies of an early version of um, the alphabet, Ka Bi Aba. Um, and then in 1825, they ended up selling 61,000 copies of a revised version. But in 1826, um, they had to actually revise the spelling. So during that time, like I said, they, they started, the missionaries started with an orthography that they knew wasn't uh, perfect. And they recognized all of these things along the way that needed to be changed. So one of the things were the consonants. Um, and they recognized that uh, words could be pronounced differently without any change of meaning. So you see a list here of interchangeable letters. Um, B, uh, P and B, T and K, L, D and R, V and W. So for an example, Hale or Hare, um, they both mean house. The L and R are basically interchangeable. Um, the word for sacred or forbidden. It could have been tabu, kabu, tapu, or kapu. So the T and the K were interchangeable and the B and the P were interchangeable. So this causes a problem, right? If you're trying to teach people how to um, spell and how to read and write, right? You need something consistent and standardized. And so the missionaries um, that decided by vote um, on the final spellings. Uh, so, and they picked the letters P, L, K, and W um, to be the finalists for the consonants, right? Um, language can be very messy and complicated and it's not always so straightforward, but when you wanna teach, teach it, you really do need um, some kind of standardization. 
Um, the figure on the right shows you the consonants, uh, Hawaiian consonants today. And this is the reason why B a ba changed to P a pa, right? Because they got rid, rid of the Bs in the alphabet and they said, okay, all, anything that was a B is now a P. So um, alphabet, the word for alphabet changed. Up until 1826 and even afterwards, there are still changes that needed to be made. Um, one thing was for the vowels. Uh, initially, the missionaries really relied heavily on English spelling for vowels. You can see that in the figure in red. Um, and later on, they switched to a system that was closer to uh, that being used in Tahitian, uh, which are in the black, the black letters in the figure. Um, they also realized that vowels in any one syllable word, a monosyllable word, um, pronounced in isolation was actually a long vowel um, that is called a kahako. Um, that line above the O, that means the O is longer. So instead of just like O, it's O. Um, and that makes a difference if it's a short vowel or a long vowel. So um, today in standard Hawaiian orthography, there are five vowels, but each one of those five vowels, those are in the black, um, can be elongated. And then another thing they realized was um, there is another consonant. Um, it's called a glottal stop. It looks like a question mark without the dot at the bottom. And this is actually something that's heard before initial vowels. Um, so it's called an okina in Hawaiian. Um, and an okina is, it looks like the, uh, looks like a apostrophe, but flipped 180. So the fat sides down and the skinny sides up. Um, and that's an important sound too. I mean, it's like a lack of a sound, but it's an important sound. Um, and so that's actually be, is like the 13th consonant. So in standard Hawaiian today, we have 13 consonants and five vowels. Um, and this is why the word for alphabet changed again. So if you remember initially, it was B a ba, and then it turned into P a pa with the 1826 consonant um, revisions. Um, and then now with the kahako and the okina, it becomes P a pa, P a pa. So with all these changes, obviously there's gonna be issues, right? Because between 1822 and 1826, the spelling was in flux. Um, and even past that, uh, I know that they, they didn't really use the okina or the kahako um, consistently. Um, I think the glottal stop, the okina wasn't actually uh, used until way later. Um, but during this time, people needed to relearn how to spell and read the new orthography. Um, books printed with old orthography were still being circulated. And so um, these books with different spelling systems competed with each other. So people really, in the very beginning, people really had some um, difficulties learning the language because it was almost constantly being changed, right? But eventually it, it like standardized and everybody was on the same page uh, with how spelling in Hawaiian worked. Um, and there were reasons for this quick adaptation to Hawaiian um, literacy. The first thing was that Hawaiian people really found books intriguing and valuable, and they were really eager to learn. Um, the second reason was that it was just an efficient writing system. Um, it was nearly a one-to-one -one correspondence between letter and the phoneme, as you saw. Um, and it was, it's, it's said that you can learn to read and write Hawaiian in 18 hours. Now, if you can actually understand all the con context and everything and the words, that's another thing, but reading and writing, um, yeah, that's a pretty quick thing to pick up. Um, the way that they taught students was really beneficial because they used this uh, syllabic method. Another reason for this quick adaptation was um, the system of oral tradition meant memorization was valued and really helped um, 
the the Hawaiian people learn quicker because they had this ability to memorize um, like in their traditions anyway. And lastly, a large number of Native Hawaiians were trained as teachers to keep up with demand. So the missionaries in Hawaii, they couldn't teach the whole population, right? But they had the system where when they taught um, the chiefs and um, other people, then those people could teach another um, like group of students and so on and so, so forth. So it really spread um, quickly and easily throughout the islands. So what materials did they have? Um, well, in the beginning, the missionaries printed hymnals, portions of the Bible, um, in addition to the, the spelling and arithmetic texts for education. Um, and the missionaries, they actually didn't even have enough books to provide all students because um, they lacked the paper to keep up with demand um, and they had financial issues. So books were super valuable and not everybody had them. Um, beginning in 1834, though, newspapers became really popular and um, available reading material. And then in 1838 um, was the printing of the first book on Hawaiian literature and culture um, about the history of Hawaii. So at that time, because the missionaries really controlled printing, um, a lot of the, the materials were religious based. Um, and secular books were just rare, secular meaning non-religious. Um, but when newspapers really took off, it brought different views from the outside world to Hawaii. Um, people learned of foreign news, um, re there were reports from trips taken by Hawaiians, there's information about peoples and things and ideas from um, other countries. Um, they also published local stories, histories, um, it recorded genealogies, personal thoughts and opinions, and current events. There was some controversy though um, over the printing of traditional and cultural information. So some Hawaiians, they wanted to print traditional texts um, because they realized people with this knowledge were becoming fewer. Uh, society was changing, the way of life was changing, um, and like the elder people, they were dying, right? So all these traditional things, they, they, some people realize, oh, these are really disappearing. We need to keep it in print. But then some people thought that wasn't proper, a proper thing to do because that knowledge was prestigious and only for traditional experts. Um, well, some people actually thought that anything pre-Christian history shouldn't be published at all. It should just be ignored. Um, because they had this new religious enlightened beliefs and those are the things that should be preserved. Nothing about tradition um, or Hawaiian culture history. They didn't need that, right? Um, so those were some controversies about what was to be printed in um, newspaper. And then ending in 1948, um, over the span of 100 plus years, there were 106 different newspapers published in Hawaiian. Um, so that's not just at one time, it was like at over, over the span of hundred some years that there were 106 different newspapers. Um, and that represented about 1.5 million pages of text. Um, and now I have to talk about the end and resurgence of Hawaiian language education. Um, in 1893, the Hawaiian monarchy was overthrown by American forces. Um, and then in 1896, Hawaiian language education was outlawed. Um, and that's, that's a familiar story with native languages, um, especially through, throughout North America, where uh, their language was banned from um, being spoken. So there were generations of Hawaiians that um, didn't learn how to speak Hawaiian. In 1922, Hawaiian was actually taught as a foreign language at UH Manoa. In 1978, Hawaiian was finally reestablished as an official language of Hawaii, um, along with English. And uh, it wasn't until 1986, though, that the state government reversed that ban on um, schooling through Hawaiian. 
in the 1980s, um, there was a real big push for Hawaiian language education. Um, language nests were created. It's called the Aha Punanaleo schools. I believe it's for either kindergartners or preschoolers, but it's like a total immersion for these really little kids. Um, Hawaiian immersion schools and charter schools were created as well during this time. Um, the statistic is that fluent Hawaiian speakers are at about 3% of the state's total native Hawaiian population um, of about 300,000 people. So that's about 9,000 people more or less that are considered fluent Hawaiian speakers. Uh, in 2012, a project called, um, I'm not going to try to say that, but Liberating Knowledge digitally converted um, all of those newspapers that I just told you about and they can now be viewed and word searched. So Hawaiian literacy during that time really helped to preserve Hawaiian knowledge um, at this critical time in history. And that's really important because not every um, indigenous population has this chance to really um, kind of keep a snapshot of their culture and history. Um, Hawaiians within like just over a 70 year span um, they were able to learn how to read and write down the language and really capture um, these stories and traditions um, of their lives during this time when it, there's so much changing in the society. Um, like traditional ways were, were changing and there are all these foreigners coming in and their lives were just super changed. So it's a very unique um, and interesting story. Um, that the Hawaiian people have this road to literacy um, that they did. Um, and now they can actually look back at those materials um, and, you know, learn about what was happening back in the day, um, as well as, um, you know, it's a part of this uh, Hawaiian language revitalization movement now, too. Um, that, and it's lucky that they have all those materials uh, that they can look back on. All right, uh, that's it for uh, this lesson. Thank you.